Uh, so konnichiwa and good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here in Tokyo. Um, and I have a confession to make. I think it's a safe place. Everybody's okay with confessions? So, I miss Flash. <laughs> Does anybody miss Flash? Well, not that many people, actually, like four or five. But not the technology. technology. The, the creativity where you imagine you click on a button and you, know, you have no idea what's going to happen. Right now, you go to a website, you click on a button, you know exactly what's going to happen. Isn't that boring? Right? Isn't it the reason why everything kind of looks the same? And I think, in many ways, we can try to experiment and break out of it. And we had a couple of sessions already where we tried to break out and try something different, try something new for a change. And I want to kind of push it a little bit harder and give a couple of ideas that we developed as we were redesigning our own site. Now, my name is Vitaly. Um, things change over time. I did change over time. Uh, but I co-founded this little site a while back in 2006, uh, which has changed overnight into this red beast monster that so many people hate. And I love that people hate it, actually. Um, but there is a way to turn off the redness by clicking on you know, this wonderful shiny button over here to bring back the red or white. And as we were kind of going through this process of redesign, we developed a lot of ideas and concepts that kind of became very, very important. And one of the very first things that we decided to do was to really think hard about how do we want to present ourselves or define ourselves, or what should be our personality, right? And in many ways, it started kind of got to me where I started thinking about why is it that everything is looking kind of similar? And it's not because we're lazy, right? We know how to do good stuff, but we don't have the time and the luxury to afford to dive in into exploring all the complicated concepts. Now, in many ways, the design process is weird and complicated, because it involves people and systems and organizations and companies that are inherently weird and complicated. And in many ways, when I talk to managers in my work, very often the creative process looks like this, right? Where you start somewhere. Oh, no. It doesn't want to work with me. Oh, it's a bit sad. No, it does. No, no, no. Right? Where we start somewhere and go. We iterate, we explore, we refine, we define, we prototype, we design, and then in the end, we hit the finish line, right? Well, maybe sometimes it's a little bit different because we're living in a, or working in very defined constraints, time budgets, right? Money budgets and other kind of things. But very often when it comes to creative process, it feels much more like this, right? Unlike the previous one, where you start somewhere, right? And then you diverge and you explore and you try to find out what maybe works better, what, what doesn't work. And eventually you might be hitting a dead end, right? Dead end, which may be one of those, right? Or one of those. And then we have to kind of find our way back to move forward with the progress, right? Of the process. And because we don't like to lose time, we end up relying on things that used to work in the past, which is why we ended up in a world which looks much more like this today than it was, let's say, 10 years ago. Right? Which one of these two possible websites are you designing today? The one on the left or the one on the right? Because there is nothing else. Right? And the only difference is maybe a position of a carousel, which is sometimes at the top, sometimes at the bottom, and sometimes both at the top and the bottom. And as I was started digging, right, I found out that this is not just the web that does it. We look into fashion brands. Exactly the same things happens as well. We kind of try to defer, postpone, maybe kind of remove sometimes our personality to make things a bit more lifestyle, a bit more natural, a bit more neutral. But along the way, well, as a result, we also lose a lot of personality. And if you don't have that personality, it's really easy to stand out if you actually try to develop one. I loved Cybertruck, right? Not because of the design, but when everything is exactly the same, a little bit different, makes news, a little bit different brings you to success, a little bit different makes you really stand out, right? This is not hard to, it doesn't have to be like, go that far, but I love the way that you really change the way of how people perceive your brand, right? And we kind of forgot about it maybe a little bit, right? If you look at the innovation in the Photoshop toolbar over the last 20 years, or 30 years actually, not much has changed between 1987 and 2017. Because the only thing we do is maybe refining a button everywhere, right? Maybe a little bit more gray over here, right? Maybe a little bit dark shade of blue over there, right? How many of you have been in this conversation in the past? 
for UI design, well, you know, let's change the border radius, the roundness of a button from 14 pixels to 16 pixels. Anybody? And then, two months later, based on incredible user research, mostly based on A-B testing, moving back from 16 to 15, right? And does it matter? Does it really matter if it's 16 or 15 or 14 or 17? Or maybe we're kind of playing the wrong game, right? Because if we keep refining things over 30, times, uh, 30 years, maybe we're losing an opportunity to do something very different, something that's much, much, much better, right? And of course, we're inspired by many companies doing that, right? You look into Facebook, you look into Twitter, where every single day, there are literally hundreds of iterations of a toolbar, of an icon, of a position of the icon, of the wording, of everything. And everything is kind of driven by metrics. Everything is driven by how we kind of define, design it, right? But maybe in many ways we can change it, right? Maybe we should think a little bit differently about that. But the thing is also, we, we, can, we haven't forgotten how to design good stuff. I asked myself, are there any websites out there that are really, really memorable? And what makes them memorable? Now, this is one of them for me, right? This is one of um, projects from Europe, Data Art, and you know, it's really sophisticated one, and it's, you know, rem kind of, it's remarkable and leaves you with a strong sense of you know, personality here. But I asked myself, can you imagine how much time, effort, people, money, resources has to go into making this happen today on the web? has to be fully responsive, has to be fully accessible, has to be performant, it has to be scalable long term, right? Maybe it needs to have a design system in place. And all those things, they're really difficult to produce, right? It's really, really hard to do so. We haven't forgotten how to be creative, but it's very hard to make creativity work within the extreme boundaries of the work that we're doing most of the time today. And then I started looking at you know, most interfaces we have today. And if I look at Uber, I don't have anything against Uber per se, right? But Uber doesn't really develop this kind of, uh, doesn't, doesn't feel like really, really strong connection, uh, that has a very strong connection to me, right? You know, if there was a service in my country where I live, which is maybe a little bit cheaper than Uber, I'll jump right away. I don't have any loyalty with Uber, but I ask myself, how come that I have such a strong sense of connection with MailChimp, right? And don't get me wrong, it's not the monkey. I don't think it's the monkey, or the chimp. Sorry, the chimp, right? But I know the people working there, right? And the people have values, and these values are reflected in the product that they're designing and developing. So one of those things is these little color books, right? That they just put out, out there for children to color. It doesn't have any button anywhere saying MailChimp is the best e-commerce software or email company in the world, because, you know, it's not so important. Email doesn't really sell. Who is excited about email? One, two, per, two people, you should talk. <laughs> that would be fun, right? But, you know, maybe it's not necessary sometimes to show that actual product, right? So this is what it looks like. It's really humane, and of course it's marketing, but it's a very good kind of marketing. It's a marketing that I love and I would love to see more of. Like, look at the wording. Hi, I'm Freddy. It's fun to be me. Is it fun to be you? How can you answer it in a negative way? Like, I'm no fun. I'm the most boring person ever, right? And then you keep going, and it's just nice and cute and funny and lovely and personal, right? And then the same over there, I love being me. Do you love being you? How can you answer it in a negative way? Like, I wake up every day, I hate myself to death, <laughs> right? This is not how people perceive it. And I think the reason why I would love to see more products like MailChimp right, is because of this little animation. It captures that emotion that I have, this anxiety that I maybe have, when I'm just about to click a button to send a campaign to 200,000 people, right? And so I asked myself in our work, right, as we were designing and developing the brand, how can we make things feel a little bit less like Uber, a little bit more like MailChimp, right? And this brought me to this place where I was thinking, Flash was great, right? Because sometimes we need to introduce some friction to make things a bit more memorable. If everything is invisible and frictionless, we're kind of missing out on the opportunity to connect with our potential customers, right? But it doesn't mean that we have to introduce friction for the sake of it. 
right? It's really easy to stand out by breaking things, by making things weird or confusing or weird color contrast or weird spacing and all of that, right? Making them inaccessible. We can break the web this way, right? This is probably not the kind of friction I'm talking about, right? Maybe slightly different kind of friction to really connect with people on a more emotional level. Now, Tijuana Flats is a chain of Mexican restaurants in the U.S., and that's what they look like inside. You might hate it, you might like it, it doesn't matter. They have that kind of personality, right? They have zombies all over the place, tall ceilings, all painted in graffiti, right? And these are the people, if you can find the people, going to the restaurant, right? They're very, very excited, look at them. <laughs> very excited, right? And you can imagine, you know, this is their personality, and so every four months or so, the hire graffiti artists to come in and unfold or continue the story, right? And that's a significant effort for 12 restaurants across the U.S., right? And this is the restaurant menu because it has to reflect the personality as well. And of course, I would say the website has to kind of convey this personality as well. So this is the website. How often do you see this on the web today, right? And you have no idea what's coming. It's just a start, right? But can you make a, you know, how do, would you make that responsive? That's not easy, right? And you would say, well, this is a bit too much. Maybe this is a bit too harsh. Maybe this is a, too much of a personality, I would say. Well, they agree with you because in the spirit of everything we know about design today, they decided to move away from this design towards something that would be more, you know, 2019, you know, clean, minimal, simple, no shadows, not too many web fonts. So they moved away from this design to a slightly different design, which now looks like this. And I think while this is much faster and much more accessible, there is a lot of personality that's lost between the previous des design and the new design. And no company knows it better than Blumberg. When they started hiring designers who were given the freedom to do whatever they wanted. And guess what? Designers did whatever they wanted, <laughs> right? So they thought, okay, let's bring Marquee back. Why not? So if you look at the site, who thinks that this is a horrible website? Bad design. Who thinks it's an excellent design? Who wants to leave the room now? <laughs> oh, maybe a few people. That's okay. That's okay. Well, if somebody asks you that question, good design, bad design, that's probably the weirdest question they could ask. Because what does it even mean? A design is not art. It's not supposed to be in a museum somewhere. Right? It's supposed to serve a purpose. What purpose was here? Well, to sell all the tickets. And guess what? They sold all the tickets two or three months prior to the previous year. So it's brilliant design, no question about that. And it was so successful that they decided to do it all over. And this was one of the most famous features they introduced next year. Right? And this is a really clear example of friction, like bringing things that are a little bit weird and awkward. By taking everything we know about web design today, or interface design, and flipping it upside down, right? Sometimes just for the sake of it, to provoke. Because again, very much like with the Tesla Cybertruck, right? If everything looks exactly the same, then standing out like this brings you a lot of attention and a lot of traffic as well, right? And there are many, many moving things over here. And it's a little bit weird and maybe a little bit inaccessible, right? But this is an example of taking friction and seeing how we can make it work. And it's not only them doing that. Captain Marvel came up this year. This is their official website, right? Which was designed this year. Now, let me ask you, do you think it's easy to design it today? I think if you ask many design agencies, it would be very, very hard to get this done, right? Many people have forgotten what it looks like, right? And this is incredible. This brought them some, tra brought them some traffic. It wasn't as successful as they wanted it to be, but it, this is, again, an example of friction added in. But you don't have to go all the way. I mean, you could, of course, do these kind of things where you move things around, and I hope you appreciate the little hover effect they introduced as well, right? Which is not maybe very respectful, right? But then if you start looking, maybe it's not a bad idea to let people move things around and arrange them in the way they want for some kind of cases, right? Maybe it's okay to make things a little bit bolder, right? Anybody likes this? Anybody hates this? When we tested it, it performed beautifully in usability tests. People like how big the buttons are. They like the structures. They like the layout. Not everything has to be predictable to work well. Now, this is huge, and navigation is huge, right? But it works fairly well. So this is just an example of friction that can be helpful. 
You could also do something else. You could take the most boring element that you have on your site or your, in your interface and try to make it a bit more interesting. And if you don't have one, invent one. Hans Brinke is a, serial, is a hotel in Amsterdam. And it's not a good hotel. Okay? If you're not a good hotel, you should not be expecting you know, five-star reviews on TripAdvisor. That's not going to happen. They're lucky if they get three stars. Right? The problem was they were not selling enough rooms. So what do you do if you don't sell enough rooms? Well, you try to sell more somehow, but they didn't have the money and the budget to do so. So they hired a designer, you kind of see the pattern here, to do whatever they wanted. Right? And they thought, well, basically you're telling me that you don't have the money to make things better, right? <laughs> yes. And so what if we make it the worst experience ever, right? So what if we plant bugs and insects in the rooms so people enjoy the worst hotel experience in the world? Because if you can't sell the best, maybe you can sell the worst, right? And guess what? They're expanding to Lisbon and Portugal now because they're sold out all the time, right? And it goes for many things, like social media buttons, Facebook buttons, and so on. Anybody that hates Facebook buttons, like buttons, social media buttons? Well, there is only way out, one way out. You either go overboard, <laughs> make it very clear that you want to be liked. There is nothing wrong about it, right? Or maybe just, you know, just ignore it altogether. Anybody likes pop-ups? No, welcome to the world of pop-ups. This is the best pop-up ever invented. I wish every single website had it, every single one of them. It's beautiful, it's super annoying, it's really frustrating, and it's great. <laughs> it really is, right? So you take one thing that's really, really boring, and you try to make it a bit more interesting. Anybody is a fan of age prompts? You come to a website to buy a bottle of beer, and then you ask how old you are, right? Anybody fans of those pop-ups? I like those pop-ups because you can make them creative. For example, here on the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, they don't, they don't even care. You can type in 32nd day of 43rd month of 1,547, and you still may, may enter the site because they don't care if you want to lie, so go ahead and lie. That's OK. But you could also make it interesting. That's one from Austin Beer Works. They ask you a simple question, are you 21? If yes, you enter the site and you're done. But if not, well, let's have a little story here. <laughs> they ask a couple of questions. <laughs> right? <laughs> right, and so as you kind of develop your own story, your own identity, and as you keep going, you don't really want to click yes anymore. And in fact, if you go far enough, you can't click yes anymore, right? And then you get your story. There is no close button anymore. And so off you go, right? And the best part about it, unlike these examples that I showed previously, right, where you know, the, the Data Art Museum website, this is easy to do. This is cheap to do. Everybody can do it as long as you have that idea in place. Right? And it goes further than that. What about uh, you know, the boring title in the checkout forms in e-commerce? What is more boring in the entire world than the title? This is so boring. Let's make it a bit more interesting. Right? You know, normally it's just Mr., Miss, Mrs., you know, boring. Let's make it more interesting. <laughs> Who would you like to be today? Well, maybe, you know, guess you imagine you're typing in princess and you're getting a post to princess you know, Mio or so, that's incredible, that's great. And it's a huge drop-down. It has 62 options to choose from, right? So again, at this point, if you want to stand out, you go in extremes. You either have many options or none at all, right? And there are actually many examples of it, doing, uh, it done fairly well, right? Maybe it doesn't have to be that funny. Maybe if it's a carousel, and I love carousels, I do. Well, maybe not this kind of carousels. There are ex actually eight different carousels on this site alone. Right? Uh, that's maybe a little bit too much, but you can make them beautiful too. You know, this is a fantastic, beautiful full-page carousel where you kind of use the metaphor of the watch or the clock. Right? And this like, kind of works really well. Something that's really, really boring can be much, much more interesting. Or maybe this, where you kind of swipe through the products and then one of the products gets to you or comes over to you. That's clever. Or here, one for bicycles as you kind of swipe left and right kind of really swipe the bicycle. This is beautiful. Right? This is done really well. 
or of course the infamous friend of ours that must, most of you must have seen before, right? And this is a really great example of how you make the people actually slow down. Why is everybody in a hurry all of a sudden? Just slow down, let people think for a second, right? And so here I was so excited to type, and type again, and retype, and type over just to see if this guy is going to respond to it somehow, <laughs> right? It's just so nice and so humane in many ways. And it's, there's nothing wrong in making people wait. You know, just maybe make people wait. That's, that's not a problem. That's okay. If they, if they know what to expect, that's perfectly fine. Or the last one, you know, what could be more boring in the entire world than, you know, a toggle? Phone and, you know, subscribe to email in the checkout again. Can it be made fun? Of course it can. <laughs> maybe make it a bit more difficult for people to sign up, right? Maybe make it like two of, make them click two or three times, so maybe four, right? So they can actually, you know, something's going to happen. There are so many things we can do, but sometimes we can say, you know, we're living in a corporate world, we cannot afford doing this, right? How much time do I have? It's okay. okay. Um, because sometimes we need to be a bit more subtle, right? We can't just break things and make them fun all of a sudden, right? I need maybe like five or six more minutes. Um, because, you know, if we look into signature, we need to maybe make it a bit more interesting still. Because if you look at custom illustrations that everybody is designing at this point, they also follow trends. Right? And these trends are kind of predictable in many ways. Because if you look at, let's say, Atlassian and Intercom and Slack and Oscar, they do have different illustrations, but still these illustrations feel very much the same. Right? So maybe there is a way of breaking out of this as well. And of course there is. And it's not that difficult. You just need to pick a theme and use it consistently. Maybe something like glitchy effect or something like that. Right? And then you just keep using it across all the sites consistently, all the pages consistently. Right? Or if you want to be a bit more subtle, you know, maybe you just use this little detail, one fine detail, like maybe this pencil squirrel, right? And then you go from one page to another and find a place to place those squirrels all over. So at least it feels consistent as you actually move from one page to another, and it also gives you personality because nobody else is going to have it, right? Um, and I really love the awards Tokyo website because all these illustrations and also little details you find as you start scrolling down they kind of make this experience very unique. There is no websites like this around the world, right? And this is really great. I think it's really, really wonderful. I mean, if you can go to an extra mile, of course, you go ahead and create a portfolio like this, which feels more like a Flash game. Flash! Flash is coming back, right? Because, you know, you use a keyboard, and then you navigate from one area to another, and you break things along the line, and it's incredible. It's so memorable. I spent 27 minutes playing with this site. <laughs> Frankly, I didn't contact the designer, but this is a different story, right? But, you know, this is really, it's so great. It's so fun. And then you really have to find your way to projects and the contact details. It's, it's not easy, right? There are no shortcuts. You have to really work hard to get it done. And this is really, really wonderful as well. So you pick one little fine detail that makes you stand out and use it consistently across your experiences, right? Um, even in a very boring environment, like let's say if you're selling you know, tires for an e-commerce site, the one thing that you can do is shapes. Just use a different kind of shape. One of the first things that we do when we start designing is thinking about the concept if we couldn't use rectangles, circles, and triangles. So if you had to redesign your product, but you couldn't use rectangles, circles, and triangles, what would it look like? And that gives you a great concept to start from, and then you can bring back these buttons and circles and all of that to make things a bit more memorable, uh, a bit more usable later. Right? And finally, the last one is to also really think hard about the functionality that you're providing and the features, because you really need to solve a problem. Anybody is a fan or understands how this works and what this is? Just a hint, it's a date picker. Does anybody understand how it works? Anybody think that this is a good design for a date picker? Everybody thinks it's a horrible, horrible, horrible design. Some people do want to leave the room. I can feel it. I can feel it. Well, the thing is, it depends, right? It was designed for a public library on a big dashboard, and it's much faster to index books by tapping on big buttons and constructing your date this way. But of course, in an airline website, that doesn't make any sense at all, 
right? It really heavily depends on the context. What about this kind of timeline? Oh, it doesn't play. So this is a calendar. Anybody is a fan of this calendar? You know, this is, this is just weird, right? Well, it depends, right? If you want to display some sort of historical timeline, then you combine this kind of uh, segmentation that you have in video editing software, and then you can play and zoom in and zoom out quite a lot to move between a lot of historical data at once. Or what about this? If you really try to find the problem on pain point and resolve it well, you'll go in really, really far. This is a video player by YouTube, and it has one fine detail. If you scroll up by clicking on a thumb, you can jump two seconds forward and two seconds back. Anybody knows that? A few people, right? It's really, really useful if you, somebody is calling you and you need to jump like two seconds back or five seconds forward. That's really, really great, right? It's kind of looking into the problem from a different perspective. And what's really important, we are so obsessed with A-B testing, there is no way we can discover this by doing A-B testing alone. This is why whenever we're testing it, there are two kinds of testing. A-B testing, you know, the copy of the buttons, the shape of the buttons, and placement of the buttons, and things like that. And also AZ testing, where we test a very different design, a very different concept, which is kind of developed in the experimentation lab. And then we compare how they perform, right? Um, and there are many examples of it, because, for example, this is a touch time plan from SBB, which is a railway system in Switzerland, right? And normally, you type in where you are, you type in where you're going, and then you book a ticket. But not in here, because in here you have a touch timetable, where the only thing required for you to book a ticket is draw a line. You draw a line, you connect the cities, and you're done. And then you have your ticket, right? And you can customize that grid with your cities or your destinations that you tend to go to. And then essentially, here we go, this is how easy it has become, right? So, now with all of this in mind, I think it's really, really important to kind of innovate and break things a little bit apart. Because, you know, one of these examples is, this, this is the last one, you know, very often we end up in these predictable patterns. Let's put a hamburger icon in the right upper corner or left upper corner, and let's have two main buttons, critical buttons at the bottom, right? But maybe there is a way of reinventing it or reinventing it, and it's worth it, right? Because maybe if we want to optimize for the thumb, it would be actually easier for people to select yes or no by, you know, scrolling or swilling their thumb. And of course, some people will be left-handed, some people will be right-handed. So you have to kind of accommodate for that. But that's much, much easier and much, much faster as well. And it goes for everything, not just the position of the buttons, but even things like reading mode, right? On Kindle, to move to the next page and previous page, you have to tap all the way on the left or all the way on the right. But it would make sense to actually use a diagonal because it would be more optimized for the thumb, right? So maybe pop-ups or light boxes should look more like this than what we've seen in the previous examples. Right? So all of this just to say, you know, there are many things we're doing well today, I think. Right? The experiments that we're doing, the designs, and many things that features on awards are really creative and really interesting. But I think along the way, it's really important to find some time to innovate and break out and break things just to fix them later. And I want to leave you with just one little video, which I think is really, really kind of symbolic for all the work that we're doing. Because you will never make things right, because the world is not satisfied, uh, satisf um, it's not satisfactory. We can at least try to make things a bit more interesting and bring our personality back into play. So welcome to my life.
So huge thanks to Pearl Studio for the wonderful, wonderful video. Uh, and let's make the world a bit more humane. Nothing has to be neutral and the same. We can make things a little bit different just by showing our personality. We're good, we're great. So let's show ourselves. With this in mind, I, I like, anybody likes cats? Yay for cats, people. Cats, cats, and meow, and thank you so much. <laughs>